Good evening, everybody. This is uh, Pastor Rodney here at Mount Tabor United Methodist Church uh, for our Wednesday night Bible study, or the night before Thanksgiving. And so I want to welcome everyone this evening as we gather to, uh, to do a, to a study on the book of Jonah. So we're going to wait a few moments as people are coming on this evening. Uh, I hope everyone's been having a good pre-Thanksgiving day today. Uh, it, probably, it may be that some of you are in the process of getting ready, ready to cook. Maybe you can pull your phone out and we can do a little Bible study this evening. So we're going to you know, and jump on into it in a few moments this evening. And we're going to be looking at, uh, hey John, welcome. We're going to be looking at chapter 2 a little bit more this evening. We had uh, started chapter 2 last sun, uh, last Wednesday night, but we're going to continue on. Uh, but we'll wait a few more moments as people are coming on. I'm glad that people are here as we are having our Wednesday night Bible study. Everybody's been having a good day. My family is all here, Micah and Anna and Rhonda and me. And so we've been enjoying having some family time. So we'll get we'll let a few more people come on and then we will get started. Uh, if you do have any prayers or praises or concerns, if you want to go ahead and post those, and we'll have a little time of prayer before we get started. And uh, if you have your Bible or your phone, whatever you use, that we will we can use that. So we're going to wait a few more moments. And then we'll get started. All right. We could have a small crowd tonight, but that is okay. That is okay. We're going to go through this tonight and uh, see what the Lord, what we discover here tonight in chapter two of Jonah. Well, let's go ahead and. Uh, Let's, get, let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this evening as we gather through the internet. And we thank you for the, the technology that allows us to gather. We thank you for your word. At times challenging, at times overwhelming, but always helpful for the situations that we find ourselves in. So Lord, this evening I would just ask for your blessings upon us. We pray for our families and friends, for those who are wrestling through difficult times, for the people of Mount Tabor. And thank you for your word, Lord, that inspires us. Thank you so much, Lord. We continue to pray for those many that have uh, COVID in our city, in our area, in the state, and we just ask that for there be healing, Lord. We ask that there be healing and life for them, for their families. And Lord, we pray for many, Lord, in our country, in our church, Lord, that are dealing with the loss of loved ones this season, and knowing that the days of holidays just makes the grief that much more difficult. We pray comfort for them, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for these, for all who gather this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Oz and Linda from Gainesville, Florida. Happy Thanksgiving. Good to talk with you guys. They're from Florida. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And what we're going to do this evening is just kind of go a little deeper in Chapter 2 of Jonah. Last uh, week we had uh, kind of uh, opened up with that. And if you remember the context, uh, Jonah's on the run from the presence of the Lord. It's the scriptural text that is used. And he basically is pretty much focused on himself. He's we don't the text does not tell us up front why he is running. We just know that he's running from the presence of the Lord because he's been asked to do a task, which is to go and preach to the Ninevites, who were though who would who were known to be pretty cruel people when it came to how they treated the Israelites. All we know is he got in a ship and he he began to he began to flee. One thing led to another. He found himself on a boat. Rainstorm happening, thunder. He was basically thrown over, and ended up in the belly of a fish. And so, what I like to do is just uh, kind of reread chapter two, and uh, and then we're going to just chew on it a little bit more and see what we can learn from it this evening. 
And so basically in chapter 117, it said uh, that the Lord provided a large fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And then chapter 2, it says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress. And he answered me, Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the sea, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I look again upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountain. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. As my life was ebbing away, I remember the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I vowed I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Now, as you listen, no doubt, to that chapter 2, it sounds just like a psalms. It sounds like a, a psalm that you would read. And very much it has the same style. Now, one of the things that I want to point out tonight, something that's kind of interesting, that we uh, there's a particular Hebrew word that is translated as a phrase in this passage in chapter 2 that we actually see in chapter 1. And it kind of, kind of it, it expresses the... This, this sense of how Jonah has traveled so far from God that he is at rock bottom. And so basically, in chapter 1, verse 3, it says, But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Okay, so we know at the beginning of the chapter, when God had asked Jonah to go to Nineveh, he actually went the opposite, and he was actually fleeing to Tarshish, which would have been somewhere around southern Spain. And in, in this verse, it says, he went down to Joppa. That phrase, went down to Joppa, is a unique word in Hebrew. And it's translated here, went down. So first of all, he went down to Joppa. So he's kind of going down. And then in this sentence, it says, he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board. So the same Hebrew word that's went down is translated went on board. So you'll notice he's going down to Joppa, then he gets on a ship, and he goes on board this ship. So he's getting farther from the Lord. And then in verse 5 of chapter 1, it says, Then the mariners were afraid, excuse me, uh, were afraid, and each cried to his God. This is during the time when the storm was coming upon the ship. They threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea, to lighten it for them. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down. That's the, that same Hebrew word again, had gone down into the hold of the ship. So what we see is this progression down. It starts in chapter 1 where he goes down to Joppa, then he goes on board a ship, and then when he gets onto the ship, he even goes down into the hold of the ship. He's going down, down, down. Then we see that same Hebrew word translated again in chapter 2 verse 6 and it says at the roots of the mountain I went down to the land whose bars closed over me forever and so in that phrase that word is translated again so basically the way these first two chapters described it is that as Jonah is fleeing from the Lord hello Norman welcome as Jonah is fleeing from the Lord that's that Hebrew word that's translated he went down he went on board he had gone down and then it says I went down it's describing this this digression of Jonah in his relationship to God to the point that he's now in the in in, in the belly of a fish and the way we would understand that that he's in the midst of the sea He's been in there for three days, which symbolizes for the Hebrew people the amount of time it takes for, the, for someone who is living to enter into the realm of Sheol, which is the place where people are dead. So what we see here in chapter 2 is that Jonah has hit rock bottom. 
He was asked by God to go preach to the Ninevites. He chooses not to do this. So he flees from the presence of the Lord. And he's going down to Joppa. He's going down on a ship. He's going to the hold of the ship. And now he's gone deep into the water inside a, a, a fish. And you can't get more rock bottom than that. Imagine you're in the deep sea and you're inside a fish. How farther can you go? And so this is what is happening. And if you remember, Jonah had asked the sailors to throw him over the board. You know, because he they had discovered that he was at fault. So you get the sense that kind of like Jonah had a death wish. That he, he wanted to die. Whatever God was asking of him was causing so much stress in him that he was willing to die instead of being faithful to God. This is a prophet. Interesting. I mean, it's a level of disobedience that you would expect from non-Hebrew people. In fact, you would probably expect from the Ninevites as the way the story is presented. But Jonah is really in a bad situation. So he ends up inside a well. Basically, the way this chapter 2 describes it, it, he calls it the belly of Sheol. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord. This is chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called to the Lord out of my distress. He answered me, out of the belly of Sheol, I cried. Do you get that? So this is kind of a, a double nuance here. He's in the sea, and it is drifting deeper and deeper to what he would consider death. But he's also describing the, the, the belly of the, wet, the, the fish as shale at health, that it has enclosed him. That he's been cast into the deep. Now, as I said last Wednesday, when we go through this chapter 2, and if you want to reread it again, you can. Jonah never ever says in chapter 2 in this prayer he's having that he's sorry from running away from the Lord. He, he doesn't acknowledge or admit that he was wrong. He doesn't say, God, you know, I know you asked me to go to preach in the Ninevites and I didn't want to, but man, I have caused so much problems now for myself, but for the sailors, for everybody. I've goofed. I am sorry, please forgive me. I'm gonna, I will repent and I will do what you ask of me. Jonah doesn't say this. What he does say, he does describe this sense that God hears his prayer, that God delivers, will deliver him, but he never apologizes. Now it is a prayer of faith because he's describing that as he was at a point of death, because remember he had a death wish. Throw, he told the sailors, throw me over the ship into the waters. Well, the only thing that meant that he was going to die. But what was interesting, once he gets inside the belly of the, the fish, he realizes he really doesn't want to die. You know, we, we sometimes think we want something until we get it and we realize, maybe I don't really want this after all. You know, that sometimes life can be tough, depression, and things that come at us. And we might want just to just give it up, escape it. And then we get farther down a rock bottom and we find out, hmm, maybe that's not what I want after all. Well, Jonah realizes he really doesn't want to die. He begins to become a little more thankful to the Lord for sending that uh, fish to him. John, that's a good point. John asks, would this be an example of treat grace? And I like that. Yeah, it's a kind of a grace. He's acknowledging that God's being graceful, but there's not even any sense of acknowledgement that he wants to be faithful to God. And that's actually a great phrase, uh, John, because Dietrich Bonhoeffer actually talked about that. It's a kind of grace without repentance. And uh, in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, thanks, John. And it is. He's He's, he's, he's aware of God. He's acknowledging God's power. Here, I mean, he's, hear what he says here. You cast me into the deep, verse 3, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your bills passed away over me. Then I said, I am driven from your sight. How shall I look upon your holy temple? Okay? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountain. I went down. To, hey, Joan, hey, buddy. 
I went down to the land whose bars closed me forever. He's describing God's power and God's deliverance, but there's no sense of acknowledgement that he was the one was causing this problem. He was the one running from the presence of the Lord. He was the one risking his life and the lives of the sailors. So he's happy to be delivered from the problem. This is almost kind of like some people who deal with reoccurring issues in their lives. Um, and they, they want to get out of the problem, but they don't want to make a change in their life for what caused the problem to begin with. Now, two, two or three times, actually a few times in this Psalms, Jonah describes that he is cut off from the presence of the Lord. So in verse 4 it says, Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I again look upon your holy temple? Now, the holy temple represented the kind of deep manifest presence of God. Okay? He's driven away from the sight, but who did the driving? Who was in the driver's seat? He did. He was fleeing from the holy temple. He was praying from the presence of the Lord. In verse 7, he says it again. As my life was ebbing away, he's feeling death. I remember the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. So there's a point where he's beginning to stand, you know, hey, Betty, welcome. That death is not a good idea. He doesn't really want to die. And as his life is ebbing away, he remembers the Lord. But as he's remembering, he's not declaring, boy, I goofed God, I am sorry. He's not changing his attitude. Now, however, at one point, in verse 8 it does say, those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I vowed I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. Now. It's interesting that he is talking about those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty. Well, that is true. But who? this was the guy that was running from the Lord. <laughs> He's the one running. He's the one that got himself in trouble. He's the one that got himself pretty much put into the, to the well. And he's talking about all those other people who worship vain idols and forsake their true loyalty. Well, guys, think about this. Compared to the sailors that we talked about two Wednesdays ago and Jonah right now, who was the most loyal? It was the sailors, and they were not even Hebrews. So Jonah, who's talking about those who worship vain idols, they forsake their true loyalty, but Jonah at that moment had not been loyal himself. And he's not even really acknowledging it. And then in verse 9 it says, But I with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you what I vowed I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. And that is true. Now we could surmise, possibly, maybe give him a little hope. Maybe in verse 9 Jonah is actually saying, I have What I have vowed I will pay. Could that be that? He's told God, okay, I will do something for you. Okay, I've made a vow and I will pay it. But we don't know if the vow was that he vowed to go and go and preach to Nineveh or not. He's, he's going to pay some vow, but we don't know what it is. And then he ends by saying, deliverance belongs to the Lord. And he does. You know, and one of the things that... <clears throat> we can take from this. As we've just been discovering, Jonah is not the example of a prophet at all. He's not even an example of someone being faithful to what God has asked of them. And yet, God has a purpose for this guy. God has a mission. God has a thing that he needs him to do. And he wants Jonah to do it. Now, I'm thinking to myself, <clears throat> there were other prophets around during that time. God could have also told another prophet, you know, why don't you go to Nineveh and do what I ask? 
But no, he keeps ragging Jonah the prophet. He keeps going after Jonah. Because you know, God does have in our lives calls upon our lives that he wants for us to do. There's something that God calls all of us to do. That only we are in the right place to do it. But there's also a sense that he's a prophet. He's, he's, he, he should know better. He, he's got some leadership. He's got some sense of, 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 of qualification. Maybe God's needing to teach this mature prophet just how much immature he's, how he much is. Or maybe he needs to teach this prophet something that he's not learning. And, he's not, and God's not going to give up on the lesson. There's a lot of grace in here. But John made a good point. John Ball made a good point. We need to be careful that we don't treat God's deliverance as cheap grace. This is grace, no doubt. But Jonah is not, he acknowledges that God's delivering him, but there's not a sense of true changing in his heart right now. If there was, he would be asking the Lord to forgive him. He would have been turning that. And we're going to find as we go into chapter 3 and 4 in the coming weeks, that he really never gets it. He still doesn't get it. And we're not still certain why he's fleeing. Now, if you all who read the book of Jonah, you probably know the end of the story. But the story doesn't tell us why Jonah is fleeing. Okay? So then in verse 10 of chapter 2, it says this. Then the Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed. <laughs> I like that word, spewed. I mean, you know, like, you know what that's, what, you know what we're talking about there. You're not feeling good, and you spew, kind of gross. He spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. So Jonah hits rock bottom. He acknowledges, he, he realizes he doesn't want to die. He acknowledges that God's powerful enough to deliver him from death. Hey, Martha. He, he, um, he recognizes that God can do all things. He gets spewed from the fish. He's got all kinds of whale guts and fish guts all over him. So the question is going to be now we should ask, what's Jonah going to do? Because it doesn't really say in chapter 2 if he's actually going to obey the Lord and go and preach to the Ninevites. Chapter 2, verse 10 ends with that verse. Then the Lord spoke to the fish and it spewed Jonah upon the dry land. So, most of you all know the rest of the story, but let us end it there. Let's end it there. Because tonight what we see is a God of grace and a rather honorary prophet. And yet God is still full of grace. Uh, I used to have a, 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 a teacher friend, one of my professors, and one of his, his same statements we would hear sometimes is that he would say that we are downright honoring and that Jesus came to make us downright good. That we are downright honoring and that Jesus came to make us downright good. And the prophet Jonah is being downright ornery right now, and yet we still don't see any real hints of any good things coming out just yet. So next week we're going to see if Jonah is going to do what the Lord asks of him. And we're also going to wonder and ask the question, does he get it? Does he change his attitude about the outsiders? Does he change his whole perspective on on what God has asked of him. Well, we will see next Wednesday night, uh, my friends, on that one. All right, well, I hope you guys have had a good evening. You, you have a good evening. Have a great Thanksgiving tomorrow. I want to remind everyone, normally we do Thursday night community prayer time. We're not going to do that tomorrow night due to just me spending it with my family and our Thanksgiving get-togethers. And I hope everyone has a great Thanksgiving. And, and if you have a chance, go back and read chapter 2, that even if sometimes we're not at our best, 
God's always full of grace. That God will bless and give us grace even when we don't deserve it. And so I think that's a good thing. But the question is, will Jonah get it? Why is Jonah fleeing? And we'll look at that next Wednesday. All right, everyone. Let's uh, let's uh, close our time tonight with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving to all you people. Have a good day tomorrow, and I will see you on Sunday on Facebook Live at 10 a.m. And first Sunday of Advent, yes. And then next Wednesday, we will get back with our Bible study. No, uh, no prayer time tomorrow night and it looks like we're probably not going to be able to do it again next Thursday night either because I have a blood drive but we will get more information on that. Happy Thanksgiving guys. Talk with y'all later. Have a good day.